Now we're currently in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7. A number of passages in Hebrews clarifies what the new covenant is. And it actually quotes Jeremiah 31, which stipulates it's with the house of Israel and the house of Judah between Israel, all 12 tribes, and God alone. Nobody else is a party to it, although Hebrews also indicates that the substitutionary atonement who is Christ, who is the New Covenant, personified, will make the enablement of the New Covenant to be uh, established for Israel, all of Israel, and, big and, all of mankind throughout the ages. <clears throat> we have the church age, the, the church age believers, the Hebrew believers, the Jewish believers in the book of Hebrews are established um, as benefiting from the New Covenant. But it stipulates and even quotes from Jeremiah 31 and elsewhere that the uh, substitutionary atonement benefits not only Israel, that first generation who will ever accept Christ alone, all of them together combine 100% in order to promulgate the finished work of the new covenant, which God will then will establish, ratify. He's already ratified it through the new covenant, uh, Jesus Christ himself. And then the final uh, results will be in his second coming. All Israel will believe, and all Israel then will become uh, perfectly uh, knowledgeable of the word of God, sinless, in mortal bodies, to live hundreds of years. That has not happened yet, and that is not part of what is uh, already established for the church, the church age. We are not completed yet in our eternal redemption and our resurrection bodies then it'll be completed uh, similar to what is established in the New Covenant, but not the same. So t let's take a look at the New Covenant <clears throat> study I did, which I started out with the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, and then went all the way over to the New Testament or the Greek Bible. Oops, New Covenant in detail. We go all the way to the table of contents and find out where we get Hebrews. Key passages relative to the new covenant that have the church in view. <clears throat> we have we looked at all the gospel passages, a number of them, that indicate that it is still with Israel, but the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ is also applied to all mankind. Hence, we have the church age, body, part of the body of Christ. Now, the epistles which have the new covenant, we looked at those. And we now look at the book of Hebrews. Or top down. The book of Hebrews has in view individuals who are Jews and Gentiles who have believed in Christ for salvation unto eternal life since Christ's ascension. <clears throat> Looking back in, in, at Christ's ascension, the the Christ's ascension culminated our Lord's fulfillment of the new covenant for Israel, the house of Judah and the house of, of Israel, <clears throat> plus all of mankind. <clears throat> so the church's reception of benefits through the one who himself is the fulfillment of the covenant, Jesus Christ, with the future generation of Israel, who is the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 52, is Jesus Christ. But it is evident from the context of the book of Hebrews and all, from all of the other epistles relative to the believers in Christ or the church age, that the destiny of believers in this age is not the same as the future generation, which is exclusively and completely comprised of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Under the fulfillment of the new covenant, a single generation of the house of Israel and the house of Judah will all be gathered in the future from the ends of the earth, restored together in the land promised to their forefathers, transformed by the indwelling spirit into individual, individuals with God's laws implanted within their minds. Hence, they will need no instruction or correction, wherein they will all live faithful lives and experience sinless perfection in their mortal lives and more, as it states in Jeremiah 30, 31 chapters, and Ezekiel 36 and 37. You can look at these, go back to them and read that. This is not the church. Obviously, everything I just said doesn't apply to the church and it's experienced for almost 2,000 years. <clears throat> we are not sinlessly perfect. We need to study the Bible. We're not going to live hundreds and hundreds of years more than we 
uh, are allotted for in this age. So let's go all the way down to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14, where we left off. Seven fourteen. <clears throat> For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. For the one, Jesus Christ, concerning whom these things are spoken, the changing of the priesthood, belongs to another tribe, Judah, from which no one has officiated at the altar because it is reserved for Levitical priests. We're talking about the, the Mosaic law worked, was promulgated onto Israel for a period of time, and they violated it constantly. But there's going to be a new priesthood, not uh, the priesthood of the old law, the old covenant, they refer that to, but to the new covenant, the priesthood of Melchizedek, the forever priesthood. <clears throat> for it is evident that our Lord Jesus Christ was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek. And this is clearer still, the fact that there has been a changeover from the Levitical priesthood of the law to another priesthood, if another priest arises from the likeness of Melchizedek. And that priesthood of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, like the law of Moses, but according to the power of an indestructible life, the life of Christ, who is a priest on the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> Melchizedek is considered one who has no beginning and no ending. Obviously God. Who is Jesus? He's God. For it is estimated, attested of him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So in view is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement such as being a descendant of Aaron but according to the power of an indestructible life in the sense that his priesthood can never be destroyed because his life is indestructible. He is eternal even God. I did an article on Melchizedek. You can take, check it out here and see who is Melchizedek. Go back to where we were. So, for it is attested of him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, Psalm 110.4. So an unending life is an inherent part of the order of Melchizedek. So Hebrews 7.8 cross-reference. And his priesthood is not one of keeping physical requirements, like the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law was promulgated by Moses to show Israel of their short-handedness, their, their inability to keep things in a righteous manner, laws, rules, regulations, in order to earn their eternal life and demonstrate a righteousness in their temporal lives. Totally failed. But now Christ comes along in the order of Melchizedek who will make atonement for the sins of all mankind and by the, the virtue of the new covenant and the, which benefits all mankind provide eternal life for all men through a moment of faith alone in Christ alone. So for on the one hand there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness because mankind wasn't able to keep it. The law was perfect. For the law, was, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. <clears throat> See, now, the, the priest on the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, can make things perfect by virtue of his righteousness and his substitutionary atonement for mankind's sins. Faith in him will allow God to make you perfect. For in this changeover of priesthoods, from the law to the, for Christ's sub substitutionary atonement, there is a setting aside of a former commandment, the statutes of the Mosaic Law. Because of its weakness and uselessness in that man cannot and will not be faithful unto its statutes. Furthermore, on account of man's failure to obey it, the law made nothing perfect. It only demanded perfect obedience from man, which he cannot and will not do. But on the other hand, the priesthood of Melchizedek, of whom Christ is priest, brings a better, even a sure hope of righteousness unto salvation through which we draw near to God, implying that righteousness and unto salvation are a grace gift from God. You believe in it, you have it. It's a grace gift. So in Hebrews 7.20, And it as much as it, the Melchizedek priesthood, was not without an oath. For they indeed became priests without an oath. But he who had with an oath, to the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn, 
and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. In Hebrews 7.20, it indicates that the priesthood of Melchizedek differs dramatically from the Levitical priesthood of the Mosaic Law in that the former was instituted with an oath. By contrast, the descendants of Aaron assumed their jobs without any oath. The writer then quoted again the divine oath of Psalm 110.4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. The solemnity of, solemnity of God's oath alone argues for the superiority of the new priest who Jesus Christ was majestically induced, inducted into his role by that oath. Moreover, because of this oath, God's oath, which cannot be revoked, Jesus became the guarantee of a better covenant, one that is based on his, his eternal and indestructible life and priesthood and not on mankind's personal righteousness. <clears throat> In his own person, Jesus assured the superiority of the covenant over the old because his oath secured his permanent installation in the priestly office. His is a ministry that will not be done away with. This new covenant will provide righteousness unto eternal life, not on the basis of faithful works to the law, human doing, but on the basis of a grace gift from God. This is all in view. All mankind is in view in here. Even though the new covenant is for Israel alone, as parties to it, the new covenant, the promulgation of it for Israel, includes all mankind. And that's the glory in Christ's forever priesthood under the priesthood of Melchizedek. So in Hebrews 7, chapter 7, the author argues that the legal, the Mosaic law, and religious Levitical priesthood components of the old covenant, the law of Moses, instituted by Moses, were inadequate relative to being righteous before a holy God because man couldn't keep it and therefore had to be replaced by something better. <clears throat> Thus the author launches into a discussion of a forever priesthood that is superior to the Levitical priesthood, the Melchizedekian priesthood. The author argues that since the Melchizedekian priesthood ushered in a superior priesthood, it follows that the whole legal system on which the Levitical institutions were predicated also had to be changed because mankind failed to keep its commandments and be righteous. <clears throat> Therefore, in place of the Mosaic system, there would be a better hope, literally a sure hope, of righteousness unto eternal life. So verse 22 of Hebrews 7 indicates that this better hope has a better covenant. The context which follows indicates that this better covenant can be none other than the new covenant as stipulated in Hebrews chapters 8 to 12. On this, as this passage continues, it will be established that the new covenant applies to the readership of believers in Christ within the period of time of the church age in the sense that the priest covering according to the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, relative to his substitutionary atonement for sins, suffices as a once for all sacrifice for sins unto eternal life for those that trust in him for it in any age in order to be declared righteous unto eternal life by grace. Thus those of the future generation of Israel and Judah and those of all mankind of all ages are in view. Wherein, whereupon the author of Hebrews provides a further explanation in chapter 8 which strongly argued that the better covenant must be the new covenant which is corroborated by the citation in Hebrews 8, 7 through 13 of the new covenant, covenant prophecy, which is found in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, in Hebrews 8, 8 to 12. So if everybody says, well, the church is the new Israel. No, the church is the church. The new, new Israel is not the new Israel. It's the new generation, the next generation of Israel, the one which we're all of them, 100% of them, believe in Christ and become that priesthood and through the, uh, the uh, new covenant which keeps them as party to it between the Lord and them alone, they will then become priests and uh, of Christ and his millennial rule. He is the priest of Melchizedek, uh, forever priest, and will rule forever the universe and the priesthood will then rule over the world's nations, the Gentiles, and know the word of God perfectly and be sinlessly perfect. 
That hasn't happened in the church and it won't happen. 